Hello, welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me and on one of my interviews, another presentation today, because a lot of people have been worried and concerned about the 15-minute cities and in particular the ULEZ scheme in London, the Sadiq Khan's wonderful dream of charging everybody out of their motor car. Well, back again by popular demand, Stan McDonald. He says he has a surefire way that he can kill this dead. Hello, uh, Stan. Hello, Richard. It's good to be here. It's lovely to have you back. And of course, as soon as you said that uh, there is a way around this, you've been doing the research on these ULES schemes of 15 minute cities and, and all of this stuff with with the uh, agreements with the council and then pushing forward with their ideas. So we've got to get this on because people just need to know. Yes. Uh, and the thing is, uh, for the viewers that don't know, a lot of you guys have been asking, where do we find certain documents? Richard has a link to all the documents that I'm going to talk about today. And we're not going to go through each document because that would take several hours. Mm. But you're welcome to read it. And I took out certain excerpts out of the documents, which Richard will bring up, and we can go over them. But yeah. ULEZ is actually a scheme. It's not the actual intended end game. Right. So what? Do you, what so uh, go just define what that means then. Mm. <laughs> yes. Well... ULEZ was was brought in under this fake scheme that we're going to clean up the environment, we're going to reduce CO2 emissions, you know, we're going to reduce mm. pollution, blah, blah, blah. Well, in actual fact, we found out now that the cameras that are out there uh, are basically license plates recognition camera, and they're scanning your vehicle. And, they, and, and what they're doing is they're actually connected with DVLA, who actually makes a small profit every time they reveal your license plates. Oh, and right. that's that's illegal because unless you're a criminal, they have no right to that private information. So there's there's the there's first number clue. one. <laughs> there's the first clue. They can't really be doing this. Right. But the end game is is actually uh, they want to clean up the environment. So what they tell people is, you know, you have to have your car, you know, ULEZ compliant. And, 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 you know, certain cars are ULEZ compliant, certain ones aren't. But before we go too far, I want to tell everybody that this isn't necessarily legal advice. It's my opinion based on the research I've done. Richard's not responsible for how you use or misuse the information. Neither am I. But what we do is we share our information with you. So hopefully you'll do some research because the onus actually is upon you. Mm. One person can't fix the entire world, but one person can share the information with you know, the world and the world can fix itself. Absolutely. Yeah, so, no, and I absolutely endorse that. We're not uh, try we're not pretending to be legal beavers. We're not on the bar um whatever it is, the bar council. Um w w this is just this is yeah, as you said, as you said, you put it over best. <laughs> yeah, so ULEZ is the ultra low emission zone and they're actually taking certain areas of, of the of the certain municipalities now and preventing you from driving any vehicle through there. Yes. So they're they're making it now a pedestrian thing, or or a person on a bicycle, and at one point there's actually a municipality that uh, tried to put license plates on on bicycles. Really? So this this will give you a clue. Why do we need a license plates on a on a bicycle? Yeah. Because those cameras are going to track everywhere you go. Now yeah. somebody's going to you know not agree with me on this, but I don't care. What's happening? Big wake up call. A lot of banks are installing new bank machines, ATM machines, okay? And in these ATM machines, like the old ones, they had little mirrors on either side to make sure nobody was spying over your shoulder, okay? Hmm. And so what happens is some person, right? We're not going to get into legal garbage here. Some person walks up to the, to the bank machine. They don't know who it is. No idea. But there's a picture of some guy. He looks looks like Richard Volpes, but we don't know who he is, right? No. So we, ta we take his picture and the computer stores it for a second, and it, most of those have two mirrors. So with two mirrors, they can get a side view here, side view here, front so view So you're saying here, there's cameras here. behind the mirrors? Yes. Yes. Yes, and there's certain places in the States, so Walmart and stuff like that, they have cameras in front of the doors. This is the end game plan, guys. And do you if, you, if you do nothing, do something with this video because this is the end of the line. I went into my bank the other day and I asked them straight. I went in and said, is there cameras in your on your ATM machine? 
-hmm. And the woman there was a bit cagey with me, and she said, well, um, I I don't really know. I I think there is a camera. And I said, oh, what do you do with the data then? Why are you taking photographs of uh, people who use it? Oh, well, it's, you know, it's it's, it's in case uh, there's any trouble at the machine or criminal activity and all of that. And she said, but I said, so have, is your actual machines in this bank, have they got them installed? And she said, oh, I'll have to go and have a word with someone. She went off, she went into an office, but she was like hanging through the doorway talking to this other person. You're going, oh, well, I sure what's in the door. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden she shut the door and I'd followed her, you see, and she shut the door on me, bang. And, yeah. and I thought, that's very rude. So I knocked on the window and she, she just opened the door and she said, I'm just finding out what I'm allowed to tell you. That's right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. And then she oh. came back and said, no, not in these. On these particular ones, they don't have, because I said, are you capturing biometrics? And she said, no. That was, okay. that was what she told me. But if you look at a 3D scanner, okay, then they use them for uh, reverse engineering machine shop parts and stuff like this, you'll find out there's two or three cameras. That's all you need to know. So right. if there's two or three cameras and there's two cameras on that thing, and then if you drive down the road, I, I would have gave you a slide presentation, you'll see there's two or three or four cameras on, on these these uh, things on the side of the street. Well, what they're doing is they're reading your life. Okay, we'll go back to the bank. So this guy, Richard, or whoever he is, hmm. okay, he walks up to the, to, the cam- to the thing, and they don't know who he is, so they take his picture, and they just sit and wait. And then you shove your bank card in, guess what? They know well, I guess you that that guy now belongs to this account. Yeah. So that's the name of the game. That's what they're trying to do. And what what has been proposed, okay, when you travel in your vehicle, because your vehicle is connected to DVLA, which is connected to, you know, your bank account. If they let this digital currency go through, you are going to be paying this uh, ULES charge, whether you like it or not. And some yeah, people you, are. I, under- I suppose you won't get a bill. They'll just take it straight from your account. Exactly, because it's digital currency. Yeah. Right? There is no more paper, you know, and physical hard asset cash. So if they turn around and can do that, if if this digital currency goes through, and this is where people got to stand up, because this is the end of the cliff, people. So Richard goes to the bank. They don't know who he is. He puts his bank card in, punches in his his PIN number. Now they got his picture. They got his biometric data because they can take side front, side front. They can make that into a 3D image. You guys can go to Google, okay? And you can click on Google and you can paste a picture in Google and say, find something similar. And it goes through, here's about 15 results. So the technology already exists, people. So now we got Richard, we know who he is. So then he gets in his car and what's he do? He drives down the road, pick, he picked up by a camera. Well, who's that guy, Who, who knows? They run the DVLA number, bang. It's married to that plate. Now we know he went to the store. Now we know he went to the, the pet shop with his cat. Now we know he went to his sister's house or somebody's house. Mm. Now we know he went home. They're going to be able to trace everything you do. And see, people say, well, digital currency is, is uh, non-traceable. Well, that's a load of crap. You got an IP address, right? With a normal internet, you got an IP address. And all this digital currency is, is controlled by what's called blockchain technology. So if you guys let this digital currency go through, it's the end of the line for everybody. Yeah. Now we're going to get back to this 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 ULES. So the ULES is the ultra low emission zones, and the idea was, to, to, in theory, that you're supposed to be able to reduce the uh, CO2 emissions. This is also why they wiped out a whole bunch of cattle, right? They because yeah. the CO2, the emissions, the methane, and all that crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally. <laughs> so that's the plan. Okay. So that's what they're going to do with this ULES. And they 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 planned this, some of this other stuff back in 2017 with GMO foods, and it gets into graphene oxide. We're not going to touch that today, but this is all part of a master agenda under the C40 uh, agenda. We can get into that later. We're sticking with ULES. Mm. So some people say, okay, well, what do I do about this, and how do I know if my vehicle is ULES compliant? Well, the truth of the matter is it's not going to matter soon but we have a remedy for now. This right. is the golden rule we talked about. So if your vehicle was built in, uh, I got the records here, uh, uh, December 31st, 1992, it's probably Euro 1 compliant. So they're going to, you know, that, that doesn't fit, right? You're not, you're not compliant. 
If it and, was built when? Well, if it was built, and this is just a rough number, yeah. but anyway, if it was built uh, December 1992 or earlier, right? Then it's no, it's probably not ULES compliant. Okay, so if it's, that's sort of like 10 or 11 years old, isn't it? 20 years yeah. old. Well, that's year 01, right? We're yeah. not up. We're past that. Okay. So if it, if it was built in 1990, what the heck's that say? 1997, it'll be yeah. year 02. So it's still not compliant. Then if we want to go to December 2001, uh, it's it's year 03 compli- uh, you know, standards. Okay? Yeah. Now we get to year 04. Okay, now we're going to do something. Now it's Janu- that's January 2006. So if your vehicle is newer than, or older rather than January 2006, it's more than likely going to be year 04 compliant. Now if it's January 2011, it'll be year 05 compliant. Now, if it was built in Sept- after September 2015, it'll be Euro 6 compliant. Those are general rough rules. Okay? So what does that mean, the, 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 the numbers there, the 06, the 03, the 4? Yeah. Okay, so what it is is right now the government says in order to be ULES compliant, you have to meet a certain uh, Euro standard. So what they would have you believe, and this is where they lie to you, tell it like it is. Mm. They tell you that you have a problem and you have to get rid of your vehicle. But if your vehicle's more than, I think it's 20 years old, you're exempt from this for now. Right. So if you have like a 1978 Trans Am Firebird, Mm. right, you're exempt. Because this Euro standard didn't happen prior to 1992. Well, this is, uh, I mean, that sounds barking. If you've got an old, in other words, if you've got an old car, you can go in with all your diesel particulates shooting out all over the place. But if you've got a modern car that's got a catalytic converter and all of these sort of things, that it's it's a lot safer and nicer, actually you're going to be penalised and told your car is wrong. That's, That's a bit odd, isn't it? Yes, yes. Now, I'm going to give you the silver bullet. Oh. This is the piece you wanted, guys. Right. There's a term in law called legal and non-conforming. Legal and non-conforming. Yes. So, Richard, I'm going to give you an example. Okay. You're a good target. I like picking on you. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I do. If you're driving down the road, your car has to have a seatbelt, correct? Yeah. And you're supposed to wear the seatbelt, right? Yeah. If you're driving a 1919 Ford, does it have a seatbelt? No. Do you have to wear a seatbelt? No. Right, because you're legal and non-conforming. I had a Morris Traveller, which was... Oh, jeez, really? Yeah, years ago. <laughs> when I was... I know, I know. I had a Morris Traveller. It was my first car. Loved it. Didn't last very long, unfortunately. The uh, inside... Um, the near side wheel, front near side wheel collapsed. I think the kingpin... It jumped out the kingpin and I veered and hit a tree and I've never been so miserable since this beautiful old classic car anyway but when I had it I mean it came with a starter mode it's a starting handle for goodness sake right. yep yep mm-hmm. and you could get it going that way if the starter motor which is often just a tap with a hammer but anyway the point was didn't need a seat belt because at that time it was the, it was it was over 20 years old but it was obviously a certain age so I guess it's legal and non Conforming, exactly. Right. So, We've if you have to go and buy Morris Travelers, haven't we? <laughs> well, it's, so the thing is, if you want to go back to this 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 chart, the first standard was in 1992. Right. So you can say, if you wanted to, if you wanted to fight this, you could say, well, these Euro standards didn't exist prior to 1992. My vehicle is earlier than 1992, so the emission of standards didn't matter. Now, what you might want to know is even though that I gave you the dates, right? Hmm. Some vehicle manufacturers actually said, well, we're going to go to the higher standard before it even becomes law. So your vehicle, even though that doesn't fit within it, like it might fit within the parameter, and you might think it's not, not compliant because of the time frame, we can fix this. Because there's two ways we can get out of this mess. One, we can go to the manufacturer. So we write to Ford. We talked about this the other day. You right. can write to Ford or General Motors or Volkswagen or whoever you want. And you can ask. You have to give them your, your VIN number off your vehicle. 
and you can ask them what the emission specs were for that vehicle. We covered this before, but I'm just going to go over it. Yeah, no, so, please do. So you give them your VIM number. Yeah, and you ask them to, to give you the, the emission specs that were for that vehicle. Right. Right, so what were the standard specs at that time? Yeah. And you may find out that those vehicle specs that they have now exceed the Euro standard that we're per, per, uh, currently supposed to comply with. And if they do, you can say, well, my vehicle meets and Me exceeds the specs that were were present at that time or maybe even meets and exceeds the specs that we have currently so then what you do when you get that paperwork from the manufacturer is you write to the dvla and you tell them to update your v5 document because this is the new emission standards that this vehicle actually complies with so it's right. no longer a blanket general thing now if if, if reviewers will remember back a number of years ago probably about four or five years ago Volkswagen was caught. Yeah. Because what happened is their vehicles would operate in a certain standard when the vehicle wasn't being driven because the steering wheel wasn't moving. But as soon as you start driving down the road, well, guess what? The computer changed the way it operates and bing, bang, boom, it pollutes worse than any other vehicle on the road. That's what's alleged. Yeah. And then they found out other vehicles also were doing the same thing. So you could use that as an argument, say, well, even the vehicle standards when they were manufactured from the manufacturer didn't comply, and you can use the Volkswagen case for, for a reference. So what is this ULES crap? I mean, it means nothing, right? And or you can get the ULES standard. The other way you can do this, the third way out of this mess, is you can get your vehicle emission tested. You're going to have a hard time finding places in England, but there are a few, depending on where you live. And you might be able to get your vehicle tested for the emissions. And then you could say, well, here's the emissions test, send it to the, you know, uh, DVLA and say, update my V5 because these are my current emission standards. And will they I, do that? Will they, if you do that, they will update your V5, will they? It'll take them forever, but they'll do it. <laughs> right. But w once you do it, then you can turn around and take your, v your V5 document, yes. get a certified copy and serve it into the local municipality where you live. So hopefully you won't get bothered. And mm. if you plan on going somewhere, then give it to them too. Right? Serve a, it's, just, it's just a certified copy. Once you have that, you're all set. Mm. Right? What you should also do when you request this V5 document or this emission standard, because you want to be a nice guy and you're going to need it later, is you turn around and you tell them you want the birth certificate or manufacturer certificate of origin for that vehicle. Oh, yes. That's right. I remember you t talking about that. So that's the... Manufacturer gonna, Certificate of Origin. Yeah, or, or it's also called a birth certificate. It's one and the same. Right. Okay? So that, that's what they're going to have to do. Now, to be ULES compliant, your vehicle must either be Euro 4 standard, like we were talking about earlier, if you drive a petrol vehicle, or Euro 6 standard if you drive a diesel vehicle. All right, okay. So mine's a, my, my van would be a, a 6. Your van diesel? It is. Okay, because they're coming out with Euro 7 standards uh, sometime next year. I think August or September. I mean, I'm not in London, so it doesn't uh, get me at the moment. But... No, but here, here's the other issue with that. London is passing this thing through, right? And they're pushing it through, but London is not part of England. Remember, it's its own city. Yeah. So well, how the do they... Yeah. yeah the so city how do they London. have the right? how do they have the right to push this crap out, right? And so there's four or five uh, boroughs that are now saying, we don't think this is right. We don't want this crap. Hmm. And we're going to get into that a little later. But that's why you have some of the paperwork you have. Right. Okay. So, most diesel vehicles after 2014 will at least be Euro 4 compliant and, and therefore are exempt currently. And I say currently because about August or September next year, this is supposed to all change. And it won't be for the good. So you have to do something about it now. Right. Most most uh, petrol vehicles after 2005 will also be Euro 4 compliant, therefore are exempt for now. And I say for now because they have a bigger plan. Mm. Okay, you can look your vehicle up on the internet. There's a way you can do a search on Google and find out the Euro spec of your vehicle if you're not sure. Because you may find some of them, as I said, even though they're earlier built, they exceed the limit of later standards. Because some of the manufacturers did that. Supposedly. Because <laughs> we have no idea if the tech, if the specs are even even correct. Now there is a uh, for the people that have petrol vehicles. There's a company called Pulse Plug. 
pulse plug. Yeah, they're in the states, United right. States. Yeah. Now I actually tested these uh, the spark plugs because I thought, well, what the heck, right? And what I found out was I got ten percent better gas mileage. Which uh, you know that's not bad. All I have to do is change the plugs. Oh, I see. I was, so these this is what they they just explain. So they sell plugs that you can swap because the yep. pulse plugs could be better than what you've got. They are better than what you got. Uh, right. Okay. What it technically is is it's a capacitor. And so what happens is you get a hotter spark. So if you get a hotter spark, you burn more fuel. If you burn more fuel, instead of sending it down the tailpipe, which is the purpose of the catalytic converter, hmm. to burn that crap, then you're going to pollute less and you're going to get better gas mileage. Now, those plugs are about $17 US a plug. But, I mean, I put them in in 2008 and they're still in the vehicle today and there's no problem. Oh, right. But so that's, for saying, petrol. that's for petrol. That's for petrol because diesel have something like glow plugs or something, don't they? Yeah, diesel vehicles have a glow plug, and it heats up the chamber, and then it runs on compression. Or some of them don't even have a glow plug. They just oh, okay. run on compression. So I've, got, not... I've got a glow worm in mine. Yeah, glow plug, yeah. No, glow worm I've got. Worm? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay buddy. Okay. <laughs> Throw that in. Yeah, sure. So if your car is not doesn't meet the Euro 4 requirement, right, they're going to say, well, you should replace your vehicle. Right. Well, that's nice and that's all fine and dandy, but what if I don't want to replace my vehicle? Or cannot afford to. Or can't afford to. Hmm. Maybe maybe you're like you and you have a van for whatever reason. I don't hmm. care why. Maybe you use it for work and if you want to replace the van, it's going to cost you, you know. A lot of money. A lot of money. Okay. But what they're looking for, here's the emission standards. They're looking for the NOx value. The what value? You, NOx, which is nitric nitric nitrous oxide or nitric oxide right okay okay and they want it to be less than than uh, 0 0.08 per kilometer 0 0.8 per kilometer 0 0.08 oh right okay so if you get your emission test paperwork back from the manufacturer which is why i said go there or go get your vehicle tested if you're going to get your vehicle tested put those spark plugs in so you're going to get your uh, nox value down then you can send that in and say my car is exempt for now because they what they're planning on doing is not good okay you would send that copy to the transport for london as well as your your local dvla and that way there if you did that you wouldn't have a problem hmm. right because now i'm exempt i met i met i met or exceeded your specs so don't bother me right that's 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 the name of the game so we can delay the inevitable for now right right that's what it comes down to and if your vehicle doesn't have the emissions data because it's too old, well, guess what? It's legal and non-conforming. So uh -huh. you're, you're again away from the problem. To re-illustrate this legal and non-conforming, let's say Richard lives on a street. And there's a, there's a rule in the planning act of the municipality that says your house is supposed to be 30 feet from the road. Whatever that works out to in metric, who cares? Yeah, that's not actually true in my case. No, it's probably not. But then they straighten the road out or they move the road. And so now your house was 30 feet from the road, but now it's 22 feet. Right. Do you have to move your house? Well, no, it's yeah. legal and non-conforming. Just like your vehicle. If the emission tests weren't required back then, your vehicle is legal and non-conforming. You're going to have a fight a little bit, but you can say that's the way it was back then. Right? Just like that, your your vehicle, it didn't have a seat belt. Mm. Same thing, right? So that's what you can do with that problem. Generally, those vehicles that are pre-1987 are diesel vehicles that operate on compression and are a cylinder to prevent the fuel from entering the combustion chamber. They should be okay because you can claim this legal and non-conforming. So there would be a big market then if somebody was able to get hold of old-fashioned cars. Yeah. There could be a big market in... You know, I mean, it depends what you do to it, I suppose. At what point is it... Um, modern <laughs> what point is it old but if you've got the original chassis the original engine you've just changed the seats made it a bit more comfortable what have you that's fine and it's chucking out you know copious amounts of blue smoke doesn't matter well, I mean, that, that, there's the there's the irony if you could get if you could get some a whole bunch of veterans with their london to brighton stuff trundling around causing so much i mean it would the irony would be in people's faces wouldn't it you say like the ules is trying you're supposedly claiming clearing up the, the the air quality and all of this nonsense yeah. but you're allowing 
a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand veterans driving around in classic car owners, people around going, hello, hello. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's bonkers. It's crazy, yeah. Mm. Now, what some people say is, okay, and I've heard mixed stories on this, but I was told and I read some documents that said that they want to charge a person 12 pounds some pence to drive per day. Mm. Well, that's going to get awful expensive considering you work about 200 days of the year, roughly. You know? Yeah, of course it so, is. So what they intend to do, maybe, maybe, is they intend to get rid of the road tax, right? They're going to cancel the road tax potentially, but they're going to charge you this $12 a day. Right. 12 pounds a day, sorry. Mm. So that that's, you know, that's not right because you pay for the right to use the road when you pay for gasoline. So there's another legal argument you may want to use. Now, some people are going to the idea of let's destroy the property, right? They, 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 they smash cameras. They cut them down with grinders. They put plastic bags over them, boxes over them. Cut the wires. Yeah, or cut the cables, whatever. And we don't condone you doing that, although I do understand people with frustration. Mm. But... What, some, what one town did is they actually turned around and said, we're just not going to pay this anymore. We're not paying your ULEZ crap. And according to what I was able to dig up, 70,000 clean air zone fines were written off. Is right? that in Birmingham? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I heard that and I checked into it and it seems like it's legit. Okay. Whether it is, whether it isn't, who knows. But so the all the time we've got agency with our banks to say we're not paying it, we can do that. Yeah, that's it's right. Once, once the central bank digital currency comes in, and as you said right at the beginning, they've identified the driver, they've identified the car, they know your bank account. As soon as you go through the air, it's like, ka -ching, we've got it. Right. It's probably instantaneous. As soon as you start the engine, they ka -ching, they've got it. <laughs> well, they got tracking devices in vehicles now. Like right. General Motors has OnStar. They don't write where your car is. If your car gets stolen, you mm. call them up, give them your VIN number or your plates or whatever, and there you go. I tell you, you go and get it, the big bully boys. <laughs> yep. Now, the, you know, the cash cow scheme brings the, the, that council about 50,000 pounds a year. So yeah. if we if we can turn around and, you know, refuse it. But once they push this digital currency and you're up the creek. Yes. So we have to get rid of the digital currency, and I'm going to give you a way to do that too. But the, the Birmingham City Council, in the 18-month period since they started the enforcement of this clean air zone in 2021... There's been 69,114 penalty charges notices written off so far, which is around 6% of the total issued. 6%? That's pretty good. Pretty good. I'd like it to be 100%. Well, absolutely. I mean, yeah. the, more people that, the more people that just don't comply, you yeah. know, you could bankrupt the... Well, you know, if nobody complied over six months at all, they'd yeah, be then, losing a lot of money. Then the system if, would collapse, yeah. Yeah. Now, the, the question becomes, well, okay, you've given us a couple arguments to get out of this mess, and you've given us a solution to reduce our pollution, whatever. Is this like you that. Solution to reduce our pollution. I like that. Yeah. 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 The thing is, is this U.S. City uh, charge thing legal? Well, like I said, if London rolls it out, it would apply to the London borough. It doesn't have to apply to anybody else unless the city council accepts it because it's done at the, the city council level. Right. Because your city council can say, we don't want this crap. Our people don't want this crap. And it's costing a lot of money. I mean, they got to put up a pole. they got to cement it in the ground. they got to put power to it. they got to you know, hook up all this infrastructure. But if we go back to, and we should do this, we actually should have done this earlier, we should go through what's called primary legislation. You guys mm. have heard me say this. It's like This guy's a stuck record. Yeah, because this, this primary legislation is the saving grace. OK, but that's no, it's good to go over it again, because not everyone is watching, you know, a whole bunch of people will see the title that say something like you, Les, they'll be going, <laughs> mm -hmm. how's he going to save us? What what nonsense has Vobe's got? Then we realize, oh, we've got Stan McDonald, genius. We'll listen oh, to him okay. and they may not have heard the other stuff. So, you know, it's, it's good to go over it again. Primary legislation. Yeah. So you guys can look this up on the Internet. And if I were you, I'm going to tell you how I do it, because it makes life simple. Mm. And we all like stuff simple, right? Yep. As you go and you, and you punch in Act of Will in Mars 1688, and it'll come up with the UK government website, okay? Act of what, did you say? You, you, sometimes yep. you speak very fast, you Canadian people. 
Oh, well, at least we don't have an accident, eh? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So you go to the Act of Will and Mar 1688. Will. Will. Will, Will is W-I-L and it, Mar. And it's Mar. Dead. Yeah, 1688. Pull that up. Yeah. Okay? And when you go to the website, there's a function there that says uh, print. Okay? Yeah. And it'll say print this section or print the whole act. Well, guess right. what, buddy? You print the whole act, and what it'll do is it'll bring up a PDF file. Okay. In a separate screen, and they always do this, so this is great. So what you do, if you're smart, is you download the darn thing. Yeah. That way, if they go change it, you don't care. Yeah, you've got a copy. you got a copy. You could say this is what was legal at this time. Yes. Because once they once they hear this video, of course, they'll be changing stuff. <laughs> but they can't change the Act of Will and Mar because it's primary legislation, but they're certainly going to try. Right. And somebody's going to argue and say, well, I can amend it. Well, go, okay, go ahead and amend it. I don't care. Mm. We're not going to get into that. So the Act of Will and Mar sets up the fundamental uh, rights of the people to get rid of the old laws, and we're going to now bring in the British monarch. It actually goes pri prior to that, but I don't want to get into that because that's more confusion. You're right. Right? So then, then the next act we're going to pull up, we're going to do the same thing. Punch in, this case, Bill and Rights, 1688. Bill of Rights, 1688. Yeah. Now, if you when we go through the uh, the uh, primary legislation presentation, which we can do in a couple of days, mm. or whenever it's convenient for you, uh, you're going to see you have certain rights, and these rights are being trampled on not only with this ULES, but with a whole lot of other stuff, too. Right. So we have to get that done at some point. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to punch in Coronation Oath, 1688. Coronation Oath. Oh. Yes. And the Coronation Oath, what it does... The Bill of Rights gives us our fundamental rights for any law, any legislation that we, we, we run across. So if if the secondary legislation, which is the Local Government Finance Act and the Enforcement Whatever Act and the Traffic Act, all that crap, if it's in, in violation of what's stated in these primary legislations, then it's to the extent of the inconsistency, it's null and void. Uh -huh. now we're gonna we're gonna really get into some serious serious good stuff there, serious meat and potatoes, if you will. Mm, I always like meat and potatoes. Well, as long as it's not genetically modified. No, no, it's not Bill Gates stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so then, <laughs> so then we <laughs> gonna have a lot of news. Yeah, I mean, it's all very serious stuff. People are watching this; they're all going, "I'm writing this down, writing it down." But you know, yeah, as you right. say, uh, yeah, right you're gonna have now. a bit of levity because you know life is serious enough. Right. So now we're going to go up to the Coronation Oath. Now, yes. what the Coronation Oath Act does mm. is it set up the original monarch, but it says that anybody that succeeds the, the current person back in 1688 is to take this oath. Which so you, therefore, I don't think the king did, did he? Who the heck? But we'll get into that another yeah, day. If Actually, you guys should watch the king, uh, uh, the Coronation Oath, and you'll notice there's a grim, grim reaper. I'm not kidding you. There's a oh. Grim Reaper rob walking in the background. Oh. We have solved that, actually. It was, a, it was a verger. Oh, okay. A verger with a pole. It wasn't, it, it, yeah, everyone's saying it was the Grim Reaper and it was like all <laughs> this. But it was actually a verger and he shouldn't have been where he was and he was dashing about, mm -hmm. which does make some sort of sense. Uh, somebody did some investigative work on that. <laughs> okay, so if yeah. we go to the Coronation Oath, we're going to find out that... Uh, the future people that take over the monarch are supposed to swear an oath of allegiance. Yes. And if they, if they don't, then anything they do... Is null and uh, void. Null and void. But the important thing is the king passed, or supposed king, passed some, some rules before he actually took the coronation oath. Ah, the king of that time. What, William? No, no, the king now. Oh, the king now. He Oh, he passed some act like the Precision Act. Oh, yeah. The uh, The Precision Breeding Right, which is yeah. which, which is now null and void because he had no authority to do that. Oh, really? That's right, because he Woo! didn't take the oath. <laughs> he didn't take the oath. And and the thing is, he can't go back now and do it because it started in fraud. That which starts in frauds can't be rectified. So that whole thing is gone, people. And we did that in the maxims. And if you didn't watch you that got video, it. if you didn't watch this is this is where it's things start to come together, and you go, ah, oh, I see the point. You know, that's why we did the maxims. What starts in fro Freud? Freud? Fraud. <laughs> Freud. Fraud. What yeah. starts fried, it stays fried. But what starts in fraud is null and void. Stays That's right. Yeah. 
Go ahead. And there, there's another legal maxim in there that, that if fraud touches it, the foundation falls. Something so the, to that effect. I yeah. can't remember the exact wording of it. But it there's says that. Yeah, well, well, there's, I think, 35 or so. Oh. But anyway, there's a thing in there that says if fraud, t if, if the foundation is based in fraud, then the superstructure falls. Right. So that, that, that Precision Breeding Act is all fraud. Yeah. Now that you've got the uh, current government operating in fraud, the current government is null and void because he's a representative of the government, supposedly. So now you guys all have legal recourse to fight this matter because the, the king did something illegal. So he starts out in fraud. So does that mean everything? Yep. Because he's, he's made this glaring error... Which he might not have been aware of. Oh yes. Oh sorry. come on, get real. There, well, Richard. I know, I know. But he, he is well. He only had a few days to wait, didn't he? I mean, he could have waited and and then have done it. I mean, I don't know if there's he's signed anything else off. Doesn't if, matter. Doesn't because, matter because he's operating as the king, even though he's not the king. Isn't that fraud? Oh yes. So then the superstructure falls. So the whole the whole coronation and everything they do from this point forward is fraud. Right. People must be watching as I am now, feeling my jaw is hitting the floor. Because yeah. we, we need to be able to point this out and did just I not, say, did excuse I not, me, mate. Yeah. Did I not tell you I have the silver bullet? <laughs> All I had to do was wait for it. There yep. it came. My goodness. So now if we look at the Act of Settlement, 1700. Act of Settlement. 1700, yep. Yeah. And and we this is, again, going to be done in our uh, primary legislation presentation when we get down to it. Yeah. And it says nothing in there can be done to the prejudice of the people. Well, nothing, the pe nothing can be can done, done to, the, to, the to the prejudice of the people because we, we are the people because we are the people. So that um, that means nothing can be done that we, when you say prejudice, you mean against us against us. Yeah. yeah. Just I'm just doing clarity for the hard of thinking, which is oh. me. <laughs> so the thing is now, if, if we go back to our. Uh, OK, there's another thing we're going to deal with called the Union of England Act 1707 Union of England. Yeah, that's another one we got to deal with. 1707. Yeah. Right. And there's there's one other act there and I forget what it's what it's called, but anyway, what this other act is and I'll dig it up some other time. Mm -hmm. But it says if somebody if, if if somebody running the monarch dies, they got whatever, I think it's 6 months to replace the person. Oh, okay. So if 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 he pops his clogs. Well, his... It, no 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 no, that's not the point. The point is that they took it into into account that if something happened to the current monarch representative, Will and Mar, back in them days, yes, and that person passed away, they have a certain amount of time and they got to put somebody new in. So somebody can't now argue and say, well, all that crap that McDonald just gave you, that's all old law. That doesn't mean nothing. Well, you darn rights it does because the Bill of Rights is there. The coronation oath is there. All the legal officials in the court take an, an allegiance to the crown or to the monarch, call it whatever you want. Mm. And the act of settlement's there. So therefore, if they're doing this Precision Breeding Act and they're trying to obstruct your Bill of Rights, which is your right to you know life, liberty, happiness, and to be employed, right, and clean food, water, whatever, I mean, you get, we can go through that at some other point, then everything they're doing is illegal, which makes the whole system fraud. Including it, the ULES and all of it. That's right. That's right. And because this current so-called king turned around and passed the law when he didn't have the legal authority to do it, and he's supposed to represent. Well, what is he now? He's a subject, yes. Yes. But he's a subject of fraud. He's a subject. Because, because he put this thing through, so therefore it has no legal force and effect. So and how, yes, okay, so, I mean, that's that's startling. And that's, you know, given everybody suddenly they're, they're putting down their, their drinks. Of and you know, <laughs> They're waking up from the sofa and saying, did you, did, hey, honey, did he just say what I think? Yes, he did. So what, what, how do you then, you know, knock on the door, excuse me, Mr. King, just like to let you know, you cocked up. Um, you, you made a bit of a blunder there. You're not really, everything now that you've set into place is all null and void. Can you please take the cameras down? Well, the thing is, it's not him that did it. See, it's the mayor of London. But I'm yeah. just telling you that the way the system normally works, and some guys are going to squawk about this, but. Mm. The court system gets its jurisdiction under three things. Okay? It gets it under legislation. Now, it must follow primary legislation, which is the stuff we just covered. Right. And then it gets it under secondary legislation. So that's the first thing it gets its, its authority under. That's number one. Yeah. 
Now, number two, it gets it from legal maxims and precedent case law. Well, I just gave you the legal maxims. I just gave you the primary legislation. And then thirdly, it gets it under common law. And somebody's going to argue and they're going to say, that guy McDonald's backwards, upside down, because it's under common law first. Well, actually, no, it isn't. And if Richard will do this, do everybody in Canada a favor, mm -hmm. at some time in the future, we're going to have a little bit longer presentation. And it won't be too long from now, because I'm going to free Canada too. And I have Excellent. The stuff to do it. I have the stuff to do it because one of your viewers shared some information with me, and I'm going to leave their name out of it. I'm going to confirm it, and then I'll make it into something that's going to be useful. Because the, it, so if you guys think this ULEZ crap is strictly UK, mm. you're in dreamland. It's everywhere. And so it's all coming under the C40 agenda, which is being pushed out globally because that's the you know World Economic Forum and all the rest of that stuff. So this is not just a UK incident or not just something that's you know plaguing a little part of the world. It's plaguing everybody. Mm. But I'm using UK law. And this UK law, because there's, uh, I think it's 23, but I could be slightly off on that, uh, things that are part of the British realm, right? Canada is one of them. Australia is one of them. Yeah. Right? So this primary legislation goes, you know, goes way, way in advance. Canada, in theory, is 150 years old, in theory. Right. Canada didn't have a constitution until 1982. Oh, really? And it wasn't voted on by the people. Oh. So how old is Canada? What, about 40 years? Right. 41 no, I, years. Yeah. And, 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 and in fact, Alberta, I think, was the last uh, province to sign on. This is getting in another topic, but mm -hmm. it's showing you that there's a problem. Mm. Okay? And like I said before, I don't know if I can do this backwards, but let's just figure out if we can get this to function. Uh, does that show up clear? I guess not. It, it's it is a little bit blurry. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll do this on a slide. But anyway, that's the uh, the, the 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 monarch crown, right? Okay. Which is the coat of arms. Now it says here, if you pull up, this is important. Go read this. Yeah. The, you're going to do your search again, and you're going to look up Union with England Act 1707. Right. Hold on. Let me see if I can do that as we as oh, we that, speak. That's not here. Oh, you're going to do. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to do it live. Oh, cool. All right, right, baby. Union of what? Uh, yeah. Union of England Act 1707. Okay. Union of England Act 1707. 1707. Yep. So there's nothing premeditated about this. Right. Here we go. No, here you go. Now, part of that's... Okay, great. Now, see here, if we look down here, it says plain view, and then it says print options. Go to the print options. I'm showing you guys exactly how to do this. Richard, yeah. Hang on. Richard, I'm just trying, yeah. Where is the print options? It's on the side print, there. Oh, yeah, print options. There, there we you go. go. Yeah. Right? PDF. Look, the look whole act. Stuff. There you go. That's how you download an act, guys. Now, you see this? You, okay. Re oh, good. We're, stay on there, Richard, because we're going to do this. That okay. thing there is the coat of arms. That's supposed to be signed off and done by every, uh, every act that goes through Parliament is supposed to have that done. But it hasn't happened since about 1707 or 1720, something like that. Go down to section... Uh, IV, so it's four. Yeah. Go to section four. Okay, blow that. Can you blow that up or can you just read that? I don't care. Yeah, I can read it. It says that all the subjects of the United Kingdom of Great Britain shall, from and after the Union, have full freedom and intercourse of trade and navigation to and from any port or place within the said United Kingdom and the dominions and plantations thereunto belonging and that there be a communication with all other rights, rights, privileges and advantages which do or may belong to the subjects of either kingdom, either kingdom except where it is otherwise expressly agreed in these articles. So this tells you right there, what does it say? All the subjects, well that's you people, that's all the people of the United Kingdom and Great Britain from, from this time after under the Union, have full freedom and intercourse. Now, intercourse means trade, business. You can do what you want, more or less, as long as you don't harm somebody. Mm. Okay, it doesn't mean sexual intercourse. Look no, up no. the darn word. Yeah. So, yeah. It, so you're, you're allowed to interact with people and have trade and navigation to and from any part or place within the United Kingdom. 
Well, is not this you, Les Garbage, trying to restrict that? It is. That's right. It is. Yeah. So it's a violation of primary legislation, people. It can't be done. Now, keep reading there. It says uh, to the United Kingdom and Dominions. Well, what's the Dominion? Well, how about the Dominion of Canada? How about yeah. the Dominion of Australia? And every other place that's part of the British realm. So that's done. That's your primary legislation at work, people. Now, I'm going to get you to pull up another one. Okay. I don't know how good you are at Roman numerals, so XXV. Is that in the same act? Same act, my friend. Right, -o. bear with me. Let's go yep. back. XXV. Yep, because some people don't know Roman numerals. Yeah, yeah, I can uh, I can look at it because it's... Yeah, X you can... Here we go, here we go. We're coming to it. XXV. Here we go. Let's uh, blow that up a bit. Oh, we, we could go. do it. The laws and statutes in either kingdom, right there. Read that. Yeah. Right. The uh, that all the laws and statutes in either kingdom, so far as they are contrary to or inconsistent with the terms of these articles or any of them, shall from and after the union cease and become void, and shall be so declared to be by the respective parliaments of the said kingdoms. Done. So all the laws and statutes in any kingdom, because it says either kingdom, but we'll just use all kingdoms, yeah. right? The United Kingdom, we're just going to deal with that. For the contrary to the inconsistence with the terms of this article. So therefore, they're telling you in plain, plain English that if it's inconsistent with this freaking Union of England Act, guess what? Void. There goes Void. your ULES, yeah. people, people. There, there goes is. your ULES because you're supposed to have the right to have intercourse and trade. There you go, people. Wow. Powerful stuff, isn't it? If you, you got her. You know, people just got to look it up. They don't know. I mean, I wouldn't have known. I'm as thick as a plank. Well, it's not your fault, Richard. People don't know because there's hundreds of acts. Now, there's, yes. a re there's the Revision of Statute Act. You can pull it up and download it, people. I'm not, I didn't put it here. We'll go through it some other day because it'll take forever. Uh, okay. But the, re the Revision of Statute Act tells you what acts have been in place and what acts have been repealed. And it goes prior to, to uh, 1688. And you can go back as far as you want. You can go back if you were to really dig and dig and dig. You can go back to the 1400s. But I'm not trying to dig up some old garbage. I'm going to use... See, they're going to come by and they're going to say, that crap is old, it's, it's ancient history, it doesn't exist. Well, how come it's in the Revised Statutes Act? If it's, if it's old garbage, it wouldn't be in there. And it was in there in 1942 and it's still in there today. So guess what? This is valid law, people. This is why we need to do primary legislation, Richard. Yeah. Now. We'll, we'll do it. <laughs> we'll do it, yeah. Okay, so now can you pull up uh, uh, UL1, which is a photograph I fired over to you? I can. I just have okay. to do a little bit of magic here. Bear with me. I'll just puff myself out. <laughs> there we go. Hey, you gone. Okay. The request for, re uh, for a review submitted by the high courts in London boroughs of uh, Bexley, Bromley, Hillington, and Harrow, plus Surrey Council Council, looked into the challenge of the major transport for London. It's called the TFL on five grounds. That document has been uploaded or given to Richard. He's going to post the link for it. And actually, Richard, what I would suggest, um, potentially is set up a, some, some uh, virtual drive somewhere, in case these monkeys decide to take it down. I'll put them all on my, I'll get my web people to put yep. them all on a special page. Okay, so now let's go to UL2. Right, UL2, bear with me, yep. Paula. Bing, oh no, that's the wrong button. There it is. Okay, this thing tells you what their legal arguments were. It says failure to comply with the relevant statutory requirements. In case the, re the viewers aren't, aren't aware of it, the cameras were bought before the... Uh, the feasibility study was ever put through. Ah, yes, I heard that. Predetermined, yeah. And it says unlawful failure to consider the expected compliance rates. Uh, in, in outer in, London. In outer London, okay. Yeah. Their proposed scrappage scheme was not consulted upon. Right. So I'll, we'll get into the, the scrapper scheme after, but we'll touch that later. Failure to carry out any cost-benefit analysis. And then it says, uh, under five, it says... Uh, an inadequate consultation and or apparent predetermination arising from the conduct of the consultation. So Richard has the documents uh, I gave them to him, and it shows you in there that the actual, there is no cost benefit, and they figure in about four years these cameras aren't going to be making any money under this current ULES thing. 
We're going to get into the real cause of why they did this. Is that the Jacobs oh. thing? Yes, sir. There it is. There it is, people. And I don't know how many pages it is. I forgot. Quite yeah, a few. It's, yeah, there's quite a few there. But it's it's obviously very detailed and yeah, it's got the word Jacobs on it quite a lot. Right. Yeah, that was an independent firm that supposedly did the review. They were yeah. probably they were probably bought off. Now, if we <laughs> if we go to the next document, which will be UL three, I think it is. Yeah, going there now. Uh, he will go there. It's got a bunch of check marks on it. There you That's go. That's it. Okay, so what happened was this thing went to a judicial review, and they said, you know, do it. D does this case have any merits? So on the first three points, they said yes, this case has merits, so you can bring it forward. So they're going to scrap potentially scrap this U list, but that doesn't matter. Okay, that's that that's, that wasn't the end game. The end game was to get these cameras put in. And when did they do this crap? They, they had America. all this stuff planned while, while, while we were under this uh, uh, other medical procedure problem that we had. I don't know what you want to call it. Yeah, where we were all bolted into our houses and unable to get out. Right. So under the first three provisions, they said that, yes, this case can move forward. It has some merit to it. So that's that. Now, if we go to the next document, which, uh, uh, what the heck does it say? Political approaches adapting emissions based on, char on charging. I don't know, Richard, if you can make that. Yeah, that's the one. I don't know if you can make that clear and give that to people, but here's the game plan. The end of this thing is they want to charge people, okay, when they use the road. So all these people that took in and, and bought into this electric car stuff and, you know, low emissions, that's a temporary measure. And probably by August or September of next year, they're going to scrap the, the, as we now know, because of this legal thing, they're going to scrap the uh, the uh, ULES plan. And what the plan out now is, because they're going to lose this court case, but they know that, they're probably now going to turn around and go in, according to this here document, and it says in there they're going to charge everyone, whether you have an electric car or what, we don't care. Okay? Mm. That's the plan. If, and if, if, Rich, if you can send that to people, they can blow it up or do whatever they got to do. Or if, if need be, I can try and make a better copy of it. But it's right yeah, it's out of the document. A very, it's, a very, it's out of the document, is it? Yes, right out of the document. So here, here's the issue with, with all of this stuff here. Um, if they do this, oops, I don't need that anymore. If they do, do did we do that yet? Just a sec, Richard. And we skipped one. I just sort my camera out. Okay, no, we did that. So, okay, we're good. Okay, so people think, well, you know, digital currency is a good thing. That's what they think, but it doesn't doesn't work that way. So if you go look up, and I'll get you to do it because you're my proof, you're my evidence. Okay. Here just go are. to Google and punch in blockchain. Blockchain. Yeah, definition. It'll probably come up. Blockchain. Here it is. Blockchain. And it says your toilet needs to be, oh, no, blockchain <laughs> definition, did you say? What exactly is blockchain? Okay, so what it says, if you can pull up the right one, I don't know which one you pull up, but anyway, it says yeah, blockchain.com dot, blockchain dot is a cryptocurrency financial services company. The company began its first, first Bitcoin blockchain explorer in 2011. Yeah, that's a different one, but anyway, whatever. Oh, and, okay. la and later create, created a cryptocurrency wallet that accumulated 28% uh, of Bitcoin transactions between 2012 and 2020 it's under wikipedia oh is it oh okay let's have a look so it's right there i mean pull it up we can we can get it right yeah uh we don't want pictures we want the art yeah that's probably yeah, it is. uh okay that one's slightly different but whatever you get the idea guys the thing is blockchain is to track digital currency and the first thing it did was bitcoin bitcoin was one of the first uh, digital currencies on the system okay now, if we look up blockchain and we look in the dictionary, Oxford Dictionary, it says blockchain, a system which records transactions especially made in cryptocurrency, is maintained across computers and linked to a peer-to-peer -peer network. Well, a peer-to-peer -peer network is all you people with your digital wallets. So if they turn on and they let this digital currency through, and if you guys don't fight it, this is the end of the line, guys, they're going to turn around and put this thing through. Mm. Right. If they if they scrap our, our regular normal fiat currency that we deal with, they're going to have instant access to this blockchain uh, blockchain stuff right here. It says a digital uh, database. Yeah. 
containing Maybe. information such as records of financial transactions that can be simultaneously used and shared within a large decentralized public accessible network. Yeah. Now, do you seriously think the government is going to let you do everything public without some kind of regulation and control? Hmm. If you yep. do, I got a bridge to sell you in Tahiti. <laughs> so that's not going to work. So if they let this digital currency go through and nobody fights it and they put this ULES through, you guys are going to be prisoners in your own property because they're proposing to put a, in a 12, 12 pounds some odd pence a day charge. Yeah. Well, who the heck can afford that? If you go to work 200 days of the year, what's 200 times 12? That's going to cost you a freaking fortune. Yeah. Now, some people said, oh, okay, I, don't, I know what I'll do. I'll go buy an electric car. But if they scrap this ULEZ and they start charging per mile, it's not going to make any difference if you got a car, a bus, a truck, or what you got. And it says in those documents that they can change the structure. So maybe they're going to charge bigger people that have like a big van or a big uh, lorry vehicle, a bus, stuff like that. Maybe they're going to charge them more. Maybe they're going to charge them less. We don't know. That hasn't been determined if you read all those documents. There's a couple of hundred pages there. But Richard has the documents. You guys can download it, read it, whatever you want to do. Store it, keep it, share it with your buddies. Because yeah. this isn't restricted to here. So what we need to do, here, here's the problem. We all know that a couple of months back, in the United States, some banks were bailed out. Right? It was mm. a banking collapse. A couple of banks merged and all this crap. Well, what happens if they don't do a bailout anymore? What if they do the bail-in? which means they get the money from within the currency system. And they take our our normal fiat currency that we have, and they say, okay, it's no longer legal tender. So, but now what I put in is this digital currency, the digital pound. And it all goes under this blockchain because we now know it, it regulates financial transactions. Richard just pulled it up for you. Right? And it controls the digital currency. So... The government has access to your bank account because it's done through a federal bank. Yet some people are going to argue that. Okay, whatever. But if they want to swap out our, our regular currency for digital, it's in the works. So that's what this means by bail-in. It's effectively swapping what we've got in our bank for this digital currency. Well, it means they can seize the money that's in your bank account to pay out the debt. Right. So you may not have any currency. And this is where they get into this... Uh, uh, what the heck do they call it? Uh, flat rate income type deal. Right. You know, guaranteed guaranteed supplemental income and, where and you I, own I, nothing and, and, and they will control everything. I heard that once they do this digital bank central currency, I heard it on a, somebody else's podcast, you don't earn interest. There's no interest. Well, no, there isn't. Why would there be interest? Because it's not based on anything other than digits, yeah. right? So, See, yeah, so, you know, you think you're putting it into save. Oh, I'm going to, you know, put that in for 10 years and uh, I can buy that uh, lovely rose-coloured cottage down in Devon, wherever it is. Uh, there's no interest at all. It's not no. going up or down. Well, that's right. And the thing is, what do you, even if you go to this current system now, what do you get for interest? 2%? Well, yeah, well, that's so better than nothing. <laughs> better than nothing, but you'd be better off to invest it if you could trust the markets, but we can't even trust the markets. no. If you remember, uh, I don't know what it was, probably 10, 12 months ago, something like that, uh, all the digital currencies across the board dropped overnight. All of them, bang. Well, how do all the currencies drop in one operation? I mean, no. one can go down, another one goes up, down, but they all dropped overnight. So if you don't think this digital currency crap is regulated, well, I got news for you. I can send you some documents that show you that they're regulated. We can cover that in a separate thing if Richard wants to, but or you can just take my word for it. But so, for, for the moment, we'll uh, take your word for it. I'm sure, you know, sure people yeah. can find out a certain amount of stuff. Yeah. So the thing of it is, is, you know, what the plan is eventually is they're going to get rid of you, Les. The cameras are going to stay. Mm. And those cameras, I was told, I haven't confirmed it, but they, they record your license plate. They also look into your vehicle and they get facial recognition and they can record audio. Gosh. Yeah. It's some pretty scary stuff. Mind you, if you've got one of these old Morris travellers, I could tell you, you wouldn't be able to record much audio with that, with that going... 
blowing out <laughs> smoke. The smoke would obscure the camera. It wouldn't be able to read your license plate or number plate, as we say here. And then uh, not only that, it would be so much noise, these things would be useless. So that's the thing. We need, we need, everyone's going to run out and buy a classic car now and, and just have pollute. The, you know, we'll all be going back into the London fog, but at least you know nobody will know who you are. Well, yeah. Well, yes, they will, because they'll catch you when you go to the hamburger store and buy a hamburger and it's got your camera. Oh, Whoops, yeah, we true. know that guy. Yeah, he's, we that know polluting, him. he's that polluting guy. We know who he is. We know, yeah, well, they'll be able to spot you, you know, driving down there. There he is, look, this, just by the blue smoke coming out the back. Well, that's the other thing. Like, well, as I said earlier, Volkswagen was caught because their vehicles didn't meet the standards they said they met. Yes. And so some people wanted their money back and whatever. But even if you buy, if you get two vehicles from the, uh, from the, you know, car manufacturer, both the same year, both the same, you know, same year, same specs, same everything, two identical vehicles, they're not going to have the same pollution standards because there's manufacturing tolerances. Right. right? And yeah. if you drive the crap out of a vehicle, it's going to burn maybe more oil. Yeah. Right? Some people get a brand new car and, and instead of letting it, you know, wear in and things all fit together. They just mash the crap out of the pedal and they wear their engines out. And they, So who knows what your emission standards are? Now, if we have a catalytic converter on a vehicle, right, the idea is it's supposed to burn the unburnt fuel. Right. That's the purpose. Of, well, why yeah. aren't we taking that catalytic converter pollution, right, and why aren't we running it back into the carburetor so it could reburn some of that same fuel? Oh, uh, yeah. But it's illegal to modify the, emission, the uh, exhaust emission systems on U.S. vehicles. I don't know about here in the UK. Yeah, no, I have no, have no bloody clue. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of coming up where we've just gone over the hour now, so to try yep. and um, get to the end. So so what we've learned here is, if just to recap for those people who are astonished still that the King has done, which I am still reeling over this, which is a fantastic bit of news. Um, we've, looking at my notes that I've got, just gone down here. Um, yeah, did the, the, get your VIM numbers sorted out, which which is on the chassis somewhere, isn't it? It's um, usually it's usually on the dash or it's on a sticker where your driver's door closes. Yeah, and then you can go with that to get your manufacturing uh, certificate of origin from the original manufacturer or a birth certificate, it's called. And yep. we, you, we were going to talk about the DVLA, but we could keep that for another thing. But essentially, you're going back to say, I now own the vehicle, in effect, I think, isn't that That's it? Right. Once, That's, you've, got, once yep. you've got the certificate, it no longer is owned by the DVLA because the manufacturer has sort of effectively registered the title with them, if I've got that right. Well, well the title always was with the, with the original thing. And so when you buy a vehicle, a lot of times they'll ask you, would you like, us, would you like to register this vehicle? And so then the oh, car yes. manufacturer turns around and they give it away. Yeah. But your government, in its infinite wisdom, sold all this because these certificates are worth money. Mm. Now, I'll give you another little piece of clue for another presentation. Somebody go look up the word, uh, I don't know, mortgage-backed securities. Go look that up. We'll have another presentation on that another day. That'll give you, side guys, all something to look forward to. So finally, then, um, with the with the with the, the ULES thing is obviously can't happen really because of the kings uh, mess up and it's not legal. And all of that's not legal, and that well, just hang on, Richard. Oh. They pass this through by the municipalities, right? The municipalities are enforcing this. Yes. But what I'm saying is, anything future that happens on with the king is is not not valid. Oh, I see. So once it, the the king can't give the royal assent to anything from now on because he is acting in fraud so right. so this can happen as it is but people can challenge it and in all the different ways that we've covered and i'm not going to go over it now because i can barely um i'm trying to sort of get it but <laughs> but as you say and now i will get all the links on the description in the description some of them will take you to my website and i will i will post them now to the the chaps there because you can't put a pdf on youtube unfortunately um, you can only do it if it's a link to a website that has that PDF. So I should do that. Oh, okay. Um, but so, but that's okay. By the time this is up, hopefully the guys would have done it. So um, don't panic. Um, that is brilliant. That gives a lot of people, no doubt they'll have a lot of questions. I think you are happy to put your contact details there so that you can sit for the next six years answering questions. Is that right? Pretty much, yeah. You have yeah. my email address. And uh, I'll also let you know that there's a Denied Truth Telegram groups. There's three of them. 
they're in their infancy stage so don't attack the guy that's trying to put this together but there's one for the there's a global one there's one for the uk and there's one for canada and there will be one for the united states because we're going to deal with private property rights in the united states as well so we will be back i shall have you back on the show and we'll do some more of these presentations and in fact probably put a whole series on my web page that you can then see all of the presentations so you can you know, if you've got nothing to do for an evening and you want to really bend your mind, you can do these back to back. And yeah. um, what, a, what, a, what, a, what an evening that would be. Um, yeah. Stan, you are a star. Thank you so much. This is uh, this is really good stuff. Really appreciate it. Um, no problem. And we'll be, we'll we'll get all those other presentations together over the next few months um, and uh, get them out so that people can, you know, work on this so there we go thank you so much Stan you're a star really enjoyed it um, fascinating stuff and lots of very valuable information I will be back with more interviews and bits and bobs of course but in the meantime big thanks to Stan do check it all out on the description and we'll be back again in the near future from us goodbye <laughs>